Hi, very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to this session on reform minded India. And this as all of us know is extremely critical to our country, to the economy. And all of us are seeing what's happening in the whole world of during COVID and we're still wondering about the new narrative after COVID. But one thing we're very clear about is the new narrative is not going to be the same as what we experienced in the past. Some people might say, thank God for that. And some people might get worried. But the reality is that we have to build on what we have accomplished in the past many years of reforms in this country. Look forward to acceleration in some cases, changes in some cases, and really see how we can take the country forward in an accelerated fashion. And the good news is that I have some wonderful CEOs on this session with me. We will jump to them after some in initial thoughts that I would like to share. And the first thought I'd like to share is that reforms in India is not new. I think we've spent over 20, 25 years. Many of you will recall that in the early days, almost 20 years ago, we started on the path of privatization, globalization, liberalization of the economy, which I think was done extremely well because we got to a stage where India started being known for many, many things. And in some cases, the reforms have gone extremely well. In some cases, of course, we have stuttered a little. Let's not forget we are a huge democratic nation and a huge economy. and Everything takes a bit of time. But in the recent past, if one really looks at it, one thing we can all certainly be proud of is what they call the jam trinity, which is the whole jantan or you know, having every Indian, wherever possible, have a bank account. Aadhaar, which I think has been path-breaking in terms of the unique identity that it has given to almost every Indian at this point of time. And of course, mobility. I mean, there was a time when we had 100 million mobile phones in this country. Not far, we'll probably, we'll probably have 1.5 times the number of Indians as the number of mobile phones. And that kind of creates an environment of connectivity, which we will all be very, very proud of. Personally, being from the technology industry, we are very delighted that apart from the 5 trillion GDP or the 5 trillion economy that our Prime Minister has been aspiring to build over the next few years, one element of that is what we call the $1 trillion digital India, which really means not just the technology sector, which might grow from $150 billion today, maybe $350 billion by 2024 or 2025, but the opportunities for many, many, many sectors which are critical to the economy, okay, whether it's telecom, whether it is transportation, whether it's housing, this whole connected electric shared economy that will constitute the other $650 billion. And I think that's the big option. So personally, I remain very optimistic. We're all suffering. Obviously, we all know and we all read the statistics. I think the ILO is already talking about close to 200 million jobs worldwide, which in India itself, potentially, if we don't get out of this fast and start rebuilding the economy, 100 million people pushed into poverty, albeit for a temporary period, maybe 40 million in abject poverty. So reforms growth, economic structuring and restructuring are as important today, probably more than we ever see. So ladies and gentlemen, the way we'll structure this session is, uh, we'll start with each of the speakers talking about what is top of their mind in terms of the achievements, as well as the challenges and what they want to suggest. And then of course, we will get into a question and answer session. So, you know, please feel free to post your question in the chat line and we'll, we'll discuss amongst ourselves and address as many questions as possible. Let me start by requesting my first speaker, uh, Vijay Sambamurthy of Lexigen. Vijay, would you like to share your thoughts with us, please? Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. And uh, good afternoon, everybody from the Harasses community who's here today. Uh, we are here to talk about reform-minded India, as Ganesh said. And uh, I would like to start by saying that uh, I would broadly categorize the reforms that have happened in India over the last couple of years into good ones, bad ones, and non-events. So, and, and I will also say that because we have limited time, I will not spend time talking about the non-events because non-events are those which uh, I consider to be of not much consequence uh, one way or the other to our country. So I will only focus on talking about some of the good and bad uh, reforms. I think at a broad level, uh, my personal view is that this government has... Uh, done fairly well on the reform front. But having said that, I also think that the government needs to step up its uh, pace of reform and also it needs to get its uh, tone right in terms of some of its reforms. Uh, with that, I will talk about some of the few uh, key ones. 
when we talk about reforms generally people i have noticed uh, you know tend to talk about fdi they tend to get obsessed with fdi and tax these are the two most glamorous uh, you know uh, sets of reforms that even politicians like to highlight because they get a lot of headlines and they are certainly very important undoubtedly so on the fdi front in terms of good news i would say they have increased the um, um sectoral cap for defense for automatic route from 49 to 74 this is good news because it is consistent with the make in india uh, you know uh, policy that pm modi has announced and that's a good one the second good one is uh, they increase the sectoral cap for insurance intermediaries for again from 49 to 74 but the corresponding or related bad news is that the main insurance business that business itself continues to be under the 49% uh, you know sectoral cap which is not so great news because the real money and the real fdi that can come in will be in the main insurance business uh, and one hopes that the government will as a second step liberalize that as well further there have also been very good uh, reform with respect to coal mining fdi uh, there has been a lot of controversy as some of us who have followed uh, india's economy over the past decade or so will know there has been a very very ugly coal scam there has been a lot of uh, you know back and forth and confusion on the regulatory landscape so in the backdrop of all this i think it's a good step forward that they have decided to permit uh, fdi uh you know up to uh, 100% under the automatic route for coal mining that is also a positive step there are also some not so good steps on the fdi front uh the biggest one is uh, something that was announced two months back uh as many of you here may know or may not know uh, in the month of april in the middle of the lockdown the government announced a very important um, change to the fdi policy basically it said that any fdi from any country uh, that has a land border with india uh, will be will be uh, will be requiring the permission of the government and they did not stop there they also said that any company uh, that has a beneficial ownership in a country that you know borders india will also require permission so in essence where what matters is china i mean all the other uh, countries are important but uh, none of the other countries bring in much fdi into india with uh, the land bordering countries the biggest land bordering country that uh, matters from an fdi standpoint is china and this has caused a lot of confusion so there are a couple of layers of confusion i will talk about this in more detail but i will just uh, uh, you know limit myself to the initial thing there's a lot of confusion around what amounts to beneficial ownership there are confusion about what happens if existing investors have want to put more money for example companies like paytm etc have chinese investors and if they have to raise um, follow up capital then also do they need money etc so we can talk about these in detail later but that is one uh, bad fdi thing as i call it uh, then e-commerce continues to be a very complicated and uh, you know highly regulated sector from an uh, fdi standpoint the government keeps trying Uh, supposedly to make things easier but every time they try to introduce more regulation it gets extremely complicated from a regulatory standpoint the other uh, big thing i would talk about is apart from fdi there is progress made in other areas for example labor laws has been a positive i think labor laws there are a lot of good changes in the recent times many states have announced in the wake of covid uh, suspension of some of the labor laws now this is not a complete uh, termination of all protections as some people have been falsely writing it is actually a very positive step that ba- takes a balanced approach in my opinion and it a lot of uh, benefits labor law benefits have also been provided to startups which are registered with the dpid there are exemptions from certain labor laws there are also some labor law exemptions that are provided uh, to the startups and there are some labor laws which are in the making which are very good like for example social security laws are uh, i'm told around the corner same with uh, the uh, you know uh, code of wages that is seeking to consolidate all the wage related uh, thing with that i will uh, i will talk further later but with that i will hand it over to you again ganesh and the rest of the panelists thank you vijay <laughs> 
friends. And I certainly would have China issue, I'm sure this couple might be. But the moment let's move on to Delta, as you know, is the managing director of Decorazi Paints. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ganesh. Uh, thank you, all my fellow panelists, uh, and as well as uh, all my, uh, you know, uh, entire Horasis community. Uh, I would structure my uh, my part in the small, you know, three different parts. One is what happened in the past, the reforms, the one or two main reforms, which has impacted greatly uh, so far as uh, India is concerned. Uh, what is happening now, maybe in the last couple of years and now, and where we need to focus more going forward. This uh, the three distinctive things. Uh, one is, as uh, uh, you said, that you know uh, we have been doing all these reforms for the last almost three decades. It started from 1991. So we are almost completing 30 years. So in 30 years, we have seen a lot of reforms, which some of the reforms are fruit results, some of them not. The biggest, so far as I am concerned, I, I understand in recent past and after a lot of deliverables, uh, uh, you know, among the our political uh, fraternity and all these things, is the GST, which is a game-changing reform, is the largest reform so far as indirect tax is concerned. Now, uh, this GST, the objective of the government was number one, uh, the you know complexity of the various taxes. So basically, relaxation of the complexity. And it turns into the ease of doing business, which is a very important thing, which in turn will reduce the corruption, which we have faced in the past. It's not that we are not facing now, but it's reduced to a large extent because of that. And the ultimate objective is that it increases government revenue. So after three years, it started in 2017, July 2017, the GST has been implemented. So we have completed three years. Initially, we have struggled a lot. But if you see the result, just pre-COVID area, era, you know, last four months of pre-COVID, November, December, January, February, the GST collection, you know, GST has recorded a record collection, more than one lakh crore in every month starting from November. So we understood as a business fraternity, everybody, the importance of GST. And everybody is falling in line now. Whoever or not, there are some GST fraud and all these things. Now everybody is falling in line. So it will give us a fantastic impetus going, you know, going forward. This is what has happened. Now, what has been happening in the recent past and now, you know, pre-COVID and you know, during COVID or post-COVID era? As Vijay already said, that the labor law reforms, that UP and Gujarat government has already taken the decision, you know, except three major uh, regulations, all the regulation has been scrapped for three years from now. Is a big step towards bringing or, or inviting investments. Second is your land reform, which is equally important. Now we have seen that you know in our country, lot of land which is termed as agricultural land, which is unfertile, you know, which is not utilized. Now this has been converted into non-agricultural land and used for industrial purpose but Karnataka government has already started doing that and I'm sure other governments will follow suit the two biggest reforms has already started just in this recent past started overall all these things you know makes into this thing that ease of doing business if you look look at the statistics look at the statistics that India in last five years has come from 142 rank to 63 rank. So it has been big jump so far as India is concerned. Nobody in the world has done so far. So, you know, hundred almost hundred hundred points. Uh, you know, India has gone up. Having said so, this is an overall uh, ease of doing business. But if you look at critically, including you know within this various uh, terms of ease of doing business, we still need to do better. Thirdly, that. Mining sector reform, as you said, a you know, couple of days back, there are, you know, auction of mining blocks and all these things. Then, you know, government is coming with the disinvestment of PUCs, though it is talking over for the last uh, so many years. But really, we think that we see that government are really serious about the disinvestment of PSUs. So these are the uh, currently uh, going on over and above that to facilitate the startups and MSME. Now, last one year, two years back, the starters are getting loans without collateral, which is the most important issue so far as a startup is concerned. 
MSMEs, the you know the getting funds for as MSME is concerned in the, in the recent announcement of government is much easier now. Only thing we need to implement that in a right way. Now going forward, what we need to do, in my view, we need to revitalize Make in India initiative. That is one initiative. We if we can revitalize, that will yield fantastic result. When we talk about Make in India, it comes under that FDI. What Vijay is talking about, there are so many concerns. We can tackle those. We are having a fantastic IPR policy. From 2000 in 2016, we have launched a new IPR policy, which is yielding fantastic result. I am giving an example. Now all this COVID vaccine is everybody is working on that, but everything, most of these things will going to manufacture in India. Why India? Because entire world is now understand our IPR policy. They are having faith in India's IPR policy. It's a big opportunity for India. India will be the single biggest source of COVID vaccine for entire world. Thirdly, another one thing, the recent past, the introduction of insolvency and bankruptcy code, not introduction, the amendment of insolvency and bankruptcy code, where if you are in a in, in your rainy days, you can restructure your 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 portfolios, anything. You know, there's a robust restructuring plan given, which was not there in the past. So there are a few things I just uh, mentioned. We can discuss you know later time you know further. There is the three things I would like to mention. Thank you very much, Ajanto. I think that was very comprehensive in terms of coverage. I now request uh, Sunil Mishra of Jintel I mean, to share your thoughts on the whole topic. Hello, everyone. And uh, basically, um, the reforms, uh, when the subject uh, comes up, uh, people we start dwelling with that it started way back 30 years, all those th- uh, different uh, ways of uh, interpreting it. But in my view, the real reforms have started uh, in 2014 uh, with coming up uh, of this uh, new government uh, under the leadership of uh, current prime minister. The reason being that I feel is, uh, of course, uh, why the reforms has, why call it so? Because there are a few questions. If we try to answer that, we will automatically we will be having a logical answers. Why reforms? Whether uh, what was the purpose? Because nothing could happen without a purpose. We believe there was some somebody who came who has a purpose that yes, we want to achieve this. There is a vision. So he started taking a, some bold measures because GST, if you are talking, it was not something which has come up suddenly. It was uh, planned earlier, but the government didn't introduce it for some of the other reasons that it may backfire. People will suffer. But with that boldness, this government implemented it. Secondly, it was the... Uh, India was considering, the government was considering whether we should take these things, what will be the object, the repercussions of implementing these things. And with that uh, boldness, what the leadership showed, and from where that boldness was coming, there was a model whereby we had a leadership who has no experience of running a federal government. We got somebody who was, we could call it an wise, who led a state of India, a small, I would say, comparatively to other states, small state in, of Gujarat, where of, upon getting the leadership of that state, he introduced several of the plans and that several of the plans with the help of bureaucracy, what he re- realized, the results of it, and that somehow gave him the confidence that, yes, uh, if we are going ahead with a very clear objective, uh, which is uh, based on, yes, intent is clear, the policy is inclusive, Investment, of course, falls into place. It should be backed by a lot of innovation and all has to be very clearly inclusive. If it is including the welfare of each and every stakeholder, it is very um, high chances that it is going to be successful in comparison to the risk. Of course, there are risks, but there, there are always the mitigation measures. Again, coming back to my example, a case study of GST. GST was a, a reform which was filled with a lot of hiccups, a lot of challenges. But again, today we see it is one of the best reforms recognized whole world and created a very unique image for India. And this image is not built in just one day. It is something, a gradual process. I will refer to one of the things uh, when I was uh, in a discussion in Japan along with Japan, Japanese and Korean people from different big groups. And they asked, why, Mr. Mishra, you are recommending that we should come and invest in the state of Gujarat? There are so many other states. What is so unique 
tell me the USP of Gujarat? And my clear answer was, we have a leader whom I have never met, but through the policies or through the interactions, whatever we are getting, we believe that these reforms are going to propel the state and it is not a um, very far. We will have a prime minister like him. And that was way back in 2012. Whatever we implemented, we got him. And with the same zeal, whatever was the vision, what he has for the state, it got transformed to the country as a whole. And when that gets transferred to the country as a whole, of course, it is not so simple that immediately the results will start coming. Because when we are talking, he's thinking of reforming entire rural India. And reforming rural India is not a simple thing. It cannot happen if the funds are not coming in. It cannot happen when the industrialists are not interested. So to get all those things, he has to take care that first the GST has to be there. Then there should be a policies of proper winding up, which came with the IBC code, etc. Then he is making, coming up with the plans like Make in India. So with that, it is a step by step which is coming up. And from, in some people's mind, which is a team working with him, top level, you know very well that how they want to achieve those targets. And for achieving, they are going one to one. And the reforms, uh, now what they are introducing, introducing is reforms for, to power rural India. What this rural India we are going to achieve, 24 by 7 electricity at economical rates, the logical, logistical support of communication linkages, uh, which they want to address, and what they will, it will address the massive renewable infrastructure, the best quality roads, uh, even at the remotest corners, BharatNet project to connect every village of India, strengthening of local governance model, and promotion of, of course, the MSMEs, the startups, and entrepreneurship. So this is how I believe it's a reform-minded India, which our leadership and we as a whole collectively along with CII and so many of the platforms as industry we are trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. And I'm glad you brought up one topic which normally would not get covered, which is the reform of mindsets. I completely agree with you. I remember when I had to go to Gujarat during Mr. Modi's tenure and I had a flight in the afternoon to Delhi and I requested the secretary uh, saying that, look, can I meet you as early as possible because I have a flight. So I will be nice and tell me, okay, come at 9.30. He said, can you come at 7 a.m.? I said, uh, are you serious? And we actually had a meeting at 7 a.m. So for me, it was an eye-opener, and I completely agree with you, and I can go on and on. But even in terms of the efficiency of the bureaucracy and much of the political system, I think that's been amazing, and we can maybe come back to that if we have time. Sure. Now the request, uh, Anjay Budhya, who's the MD of Pattern Group, for your thoughts, Sanjay. Thank you, Ganesh. And thank you, my dear friends, who I believe are more than 1,000 from across 45 countries. And I would like to place on record my sincere thanks to our friend, Frank, for organizing this meeting, virtual meeting, so successfully. And I think this becomes the new normal when we are all here, respective in our offices or in homes and talking both about India and how India can engage with the global community and how our partnership with our Honorable Minister for Commerce and Industries and Railways, Piyush Goelji, address in the morning that this is the time for India, this is the time of India, and how do we engage ourselves. Friends, as all of us know, due to the current COVID situation, due to the global trade tensions, people are looking for alternate choices. Companies are looking to relocate, and this is the time for India. That How and what India offers, if we want to dwell a little more, my esteemed colleagues, they have all talked about the reforms, what the government has enacted during last few months, what has been done during last few years, I'm not going into decades. If you look at the advantages, let us come to the, you know, why should anybody come to you? That's a very simple, you know, you say, you talk business like, why should I come to you? It's very, very simple. In India, if you want to come to set up a manufacturing base, you want to come here to buy or to source, to outsource what we have and what we don't have. India with our, you know, skill, India with the raw materials, with your legal strong IPR system and the communication is in terms of the ease in timing when you you know talk to your US counterparts or your European counterparts, there is a convenience. So there are a lot of factors and ultimately our quality and commitment. That is what it matters. We are also in exports, I chair CI National Committee on Exports, but even personally I would say that you know during the last 
those two months when we had the lockdown and you know we suffered on the exports but we had we had shipped the goods we had the cost of the goods maybe even more you know, the freight maybe more than the cost of the goods but that is the quality and that is the commitment i'm saying the quality of commitment because the commitment matters and the customer knows that you won't let him bound so the world as i said is looking for what we have a government which is participative which is responsive and our commerce minister cpus goelji i must say that you know he has engaged himself with industry interactions at different levels whether it was from the industry chambers not only national industry associations like cii fiki or socham but even industry chambers at a different metros tier 2 cities ypo wpo at all levels he has been interacting our other minister mr gadkari ji and all you know different levels secretaries i would say you know people from dgft office secretary logistics they opened a war room there and you know 24 by 7 issues were raised and they were solved and we were constantly in engagement if i can go one further and say that the kind of reforms what has happened in last 3 months it is other way around when we are talking of lockdown it is the other way down that you know we have unlocked many things which were not happening earlier because i think if you look at everything whether it's a glass half full or half empty you know we had more time we had time to introspect whether both in industry and also at government level that you know what can be done and you can do multiple meetings you can do multiple engagements and a lot of serious introspection even in our own organizations even they say same with the government engagement they want to respond and they want to i think for the global community this is the perfect time when we need to join hands india offers everything what you need and you know our partnership is very strong have it look at india you know india itself is a continent you know we have across wherever in whatever product there are strengths raw materials language skill processes legal rights and i think we invite all of you our global friends from across 45 countries who are joining in this horses community come look at india join hands with you we are waiting for you thank you thank you san sanjay that was that was a very positive statement and i completely agree with you because i myself on the board of a company which came in a, a week to 85% of full capacity and this is a company which employs close to 43000 people and it, okay that's it that's easy because you may say it's easy to work from home but even as recently as two days back many of you would have read which is multiple plants across maharashtra they have 80% production capacity they are understanding the performance of the supply chains and the demand chains and i would say that you and many other people are so positive because this is the way i think india has to bounce back yeah i can just add the last line that you know as I, my earlier colleague said make in india but make for the world thank you absolutely absolutely i think that's that's so critical thank you sanjay so now i'm going to request my my long term consulting friend that was now on the board of kpmg in the uae uh, sir richard reki to give us his views a uh, more macro perspective and what he feels yeah. can be done for them richard okay. uh, yeah thanks uh, ganesh and uh, good afternoon everybody whoever is listening into this uh, uh, video conference and uh, i think the uh, i would ganesh just go a little bit back because you know every crisis has actually thrown up opportunities when the plague you know that famous plague happened uh, uh, at that time because so many people died the price of labor went up and you know uh, people's salaries went up the, the because there were fewer people and jobs were obviously there world war 2 helped women employment because the men were killed in the war women employment started um, so uh, and then we had 911 where because of the security attacks Uh, what happened was the entire way we travel the way we accepted privacy we accepted ki yes security is important so we can discount our privacy if we need security and and then of course 2003 sars actually first time brought in a big way online today which uh, and then of course now we have got covid covid is bringing its own at least the initial early signs are work from home these online meetings is a very clear indication where it is going to be i don't think people are going to travel much so it will may bring much more productivity efficiency whatever initial reports have come out uh, most companies who have adopted a work from home have seen productivity going up so i think uh, that's a clear sign 
online is getting very much big and of course it uh, artificial intelligence it pervasiveness into our lives has become much more and will become much more it was uh, and online education online i mean ganesh you are involved into some of that online education online training lnd everything is moved there so and then also i do not know whether people remember a few issues back the world the sorry economists took out the headline saying planet earth is closed now that was a reality there was a lockdown all over the world and when you want to study india and understand where india is today i think we should understand what's happening around on the global side before we come down to india and according to the harvard uh, business review they said that global trade will fall between 13 to 30% 13 to 30% and fdi around the world will fall 30 to 40% and if we saw what uh, geo did where they garnered so much of fdi 50% of uh, global fdi into telecom actually came to one company and that is geo so that itself proves how attractive uh, how people are looking at india how people are positively looking at india it's a, it's a great sign actually uh world bank has predicted the global economy is going to contract 5.2 i just want to put this in context was when you look at india then we should look at it in that context bankruptcy is going to so unemployment is at an all time high uh, globally i'm talking of now and uh, of course this uh, with the china kind of tirade that is happening i think it's also important to realize that multinational companies western companies which are in china are going to look for an alternate somewhere and they're going to look somewhere in asia can india become that destination and we just heard one of the panelists said where we went up in our ranking from 140 to 60 uh, 80 or 90 places which was fantastic on the world bank ranking the the so this creates great amount of confidence ki india is in a reform mindset and is moving forward uh, from that point so i think uh, uh, and then when we had gdp numbers come in for march uh, it was 4.2% and if you look around the world i think one of the few countries which is still positive uh, everybody else is in a negative gdp so that also is a great sign uh, and we need to go up from here so while gdp did fall uh, i mean 4.2 by india standard but what we saw uh, what we have seen um, is in may there has been increased consumption of electricity uh, grocery pharmaceuticals usage of e-commerce online platforms mobility these have actually taken a big uptake and in fact i was talking to uh, one person who's into agritech and he's saying in the last two months his business has doubled to what it was so i think there have been a lot of businesses which have while some businesses have suffered let's be clear about it the hospitality and airline industry but there are number of businesses that have actually gone up so from a I think from a macro point of view Ganesh I think India is in a good strong position on a macro level we are going through a temporary bump yes investment has fallen this has fallen our consumption is down but these are in my view in my personal view these are temporary bumps which we are going through and we need to take certain steps which will help us actually and you know some of the you look at the monetary policy very accommodative it is just reacting responding to the market on a very very they not waiting for a monetary policy to come out they come and make those announcements uh, trying to induce and saying okay what is going to be there so and you saw india having one big jump in ranking in resolving insolvency with some we heard about insolvency we were actually we came 52nd rank from 108 so that itself these i mean when you go down the world bank ranking there are few places where we have had much more positive impact uh then uh, uh then uh, in other cases i think the one big uh, challenge india is having currently uh, is consumption and i think we need to put money into the hands of people and i would be a little bit radical out here by saying that i think government should look for a temporary uh, temporary uh, point of view reduce the gst and the income tax i mean this is not permanent this is a temporary reduction so you put more money into the hand of people because gst everybody is paying it from the poorest person to the richest person they are paying gst so i think we should look and say that how do we reduce the gst rate for a temporary period till this covid last and you know and, and put more and let it make it cheaper the goods I think India's big challenge has been logistics. We've been discussing on it every conference when we talk about it. Our logistics cost is between thirteen to fifteen, fifteen uh, percent of production. Globally, it's about six percent. 
and i think uh, you know those freight corridors dedicated freight corridors and all that we had unfortunately they have not come up if they had come up we were expected to reduce this cost down but i think somewhere along the line i think the logistics and when i talk of logistics i'm talking overall infrastructure ganesh and when we talk of infrastructure if we work on infrastructure i think this make in india or assemble in india what we have got will become a reality because if infrastructure issues are sorted out i think india's uh, ability to produce uh, will be much more competitive than what it is today so i think that is one we have got demographic dividend um, <clears throat> according to a report that i had recently read 18.6% of global labor force by 2027 Uh, india's working age population will be you know having about uh, 18.6% of the global workforce we have a lot of quality workforce if you look at re- um, last 8 10 15 20 years uh, a lot of r and d centers have been set up here because obviously the talent that is available so it's just not about back offices is also some of the r and d research centers that have actually come in out here and we should not get too worried about this localization uh, which we are talking about the government is talking about in the sense i'm not saying it is my view it is not isolating india from the rest of the world it is just making us more self reliant and also trying to make us part of the global supply chain because we are still not part of the global supply chain we need to become part of the global supply chain has that opportunity come now because of china Yeah, and yeah. can we actually take advantage of this global supply chain i would say uh, we should look at that secondly i would say that we should specialize um, um, you know one of the panelists he said about ipr and he said about the pharmaceutical industry i think for the uh, after a long time the pharma industry is back on the top it has been respected it has got a huge amount of uh, this thing so do you think i mean this is my view that india should give some benefits to three or four sectors and just given to all their demands there are three or four industry sectors like the farmer like some others and says okay come on let me give you you know we did it with the it industry we saw the benefit of it right we can do it with three or four sectors and say okay give them whatever they want and they will propel the growth for india i think so that is something that i would like to leave out here as uh, and of course this uh, <clears throat> you know the 20 lakh crore package i know a lot has been spoken about it but there is a lot of reform put into it it may not be immediate but there are a lot of reforms whether it is for msmes whether it's nbfcs whether it is uh, hfcs agriculture sector reforms some fundamental reforms you're talking of ease of doing business part distribution reforms so a lot of things have actually been put into that package and it will come over the next 2 3 years nothing happens immediately it will take time for a lot of these things to fructify i think on that note uh, ganesh i will end out here and uh, just uh, we can discuss further Oh, thank you very much, Richard. I think very, very comprehensive. And my yeah. young entrepreneur friend from Pune, Neha Vatsala, says that's the most positive statement she has ever heard. Thank you for sharing. So that was nice. So we have very little time, gentlemen and ladies. So we have about seven minutes. So let me ask some quick questions. Uh, in fact, three very interesting questions from Mr. Suket Singhal. And the first, of course, he asked a very tough question, if I may say so, saying that look, we can talk about all the sectors. but the power sector in india is in crying need for reform so would any of you like to comment on anything that specific that needs to be done in the power sector uh, just just unmute yourself uh, sun vijay you still on mute 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 you were in un- un- unmute vijay unmute yeah Okay, sorry, Ganesh. Was that question for me? Anybody? Anybody? I mean, because he is very worried about the power sector, saying, "What? Where are we going?" And it needs like serious policy changes, operational changes. So I was just wondering whether any of you had a view on that. See, my personal view is as follows. Uh, I think the. I mean, there is no uh, disputing the fact that the power sector is in trouble, and it's not just in trouble; it's in a lot of trouble. Uh, some states have done better. with their power situation than the others but overall i think this whole uh, uh, you know privatize if i look at infrastructure which is by the way an area i focus on a lot both from a professional perspective and also because i'm passionate about it if i look at uh, other sectors like roads or airports in comparison to that the privatization story has not gone so rosily with respect to power sector and ironically 
it is the sector on which much of the rest of the economy depends so the if there is no reliable or adequate power available the rest of the industry suffers everything else suffers so therefore it's a very uh, you know pertinent and valid point that uh, you know suket has made that in terms of what we can do about it a uh, couple of you know obvious points i'll make um, first thing i think that needs to be fixed uh, is with respect to uh, the whole uh, npas mess that surrounds the power sector uh, there is there is uh, it probably is the sector that contributes to the biggest share of npas of uh, indian banks and financial institutions so i think government needs to start by giving some sort of a stimulus package i think uh, because it has reached a position where i think they need some sort of a jump start without a jump start the engine is not going to come back again uh, that's number one number two i think they need to uh, create uh, you know a more conducive atmosphere for creating fuel linkages for ensuring that there are adequate uh, fuel supply arrangements in place for the longest time we went on a spree promoting thermal power projects without having any ability to guarantee coal and companies had to come up with jugad a typical indian jugad and we had to go on you know power companies had to go and buy uh, you know acquisitions in uh, indonesia because we wanted to buy coal mines there Uh, which were much uh, cheaper than and more reliable than indian coal and that we are sorted because indonesia started imposing export restrictions and price controls on the export of its coal so again we uh, i think that is one big issue uh, guaranteeing proper uh, you know uh, fuel linkages uh, the second thing is i think there has to be a better power market created uh, i mean uh, every few years there is a kind of a fluctuation with respect to you know whether a power producer should rely on merchant uh, opportunities or whether they should tie up uh, ppa with a state electricity board well of course a ppa sounds like a stable option it creates cash flow problems because the state electricity boards often don't pay up on time and the merchant opportunities also cannot be tapped because of that so these are a couple of points i would quickly touch upon uh, i know we are short on time so i'll uh, yeah this i think it's a quick comment because you been all exports coming to competition so do you think you agree about the balance of exports and imports with china any quick comments on that because it is going up in china's favor for last many many years it's it's can you please repeat again we should we be worried about the balance of export import with china because china is exporting so much to india indian exports to china are not going very far so i think that we should be concerned about or do yeah of course we are very concerned but i think now that time we are in the whole situation seems to be changing so you know things are very very fluid and let's see how things are no no i agree with you in fact in fact i was in a session the other day where we talked about you know there's so many things right from toys telecom hardware apps of course that we all know about and 80 72% of our mobile phones so clearly something there and i think you should mention that this whole atmanirbhar movement is something we should look at not as excluding other people but really being in you know, leveraging the next make in india to so ganesh one ganesh sorry to come in here but i think china also has got a lot of investments into a lot of indian companies and lot of these uh, unicorns etc so i think one should not uh, you know take a eyes of that also because uh, there is huge amount of money actually in india through alibaba paytm not paytm this uh, 10 cents etc so a lot of and also the smaller side there have been a lot of uh, i know people who have gone and uh, brought in a lot of money from china before so uh, yeah no oh, absolutely yeah. i think and i think we can be we can be very short sighted and just say okay we we'll wish away everything uh, ganesh can i add one point because we talk about infrastructure i would just like to give this one thought here i think the government should seriously think of an infrastructure development fund if we want to go for large scale infrastructure the banking sector cannot afford to fund it or it is not poised to fund it i think we need a infrastructure development fund on the large scale not the one we have got which is very small we need it on a big scale literally and whether we use our forex reserve to create a sovereign wealth fund and you know use some of that money because when will you use it this is the time to use it i just thought i leave this thought out here absolutely and uh, i am sorry but we have to get this to close but first of all thank you very much i think you all made some really fabulous points 
and I think we end with average optimism, if not more, because the opportunity for India has never been greater. COVID is still phenomenal, and I'm sure if you look at all the sectors we talk about and the three or four sectors which Richard rightly said would be focus areas, we still have a great future. So thank you very much, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to us, and enjoy the rest of this wonderful Horasis India conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great talking to you. Thank you. Bye.